I have a long history in working with integrated pest management before coming to the Department of Ag, uh, with different extension, uh, Cornell, and other places. So a lot of interaction with uh, growers, uh, different agencies, etc. So my role, they're going to bring up the PowerPoint. My role was to serve as the coordinator of a multi-agency um, group of um, bringing together the different talents, uh, expertise from different agencies um, defined by the Minnesota Pollinator Legislation to convene in a, a pollinator advisory uh, work group. And we're still doing it. <coughs> Little song and dance. Oh, well, I could tell stories, but <laughs> some of them were pretty bad. There we go. There we go. Okay. Actually, I could have given the presentation without PowerPoint. Sometimes I think PowerPoints are kind of distracting. So um, let's go on. Uh, pollinator legislation was passed in May of last year. Uh, MDA and our MPCA Board of Water, Soil and Resources, and the U of M were specifically mentioned in the pollinator legislation bill. And in there was a uh, task or requirement to present a pollinator report to the Minnesota legislature. In that report, it must include a proposal for pollinator habitats. Uh, proposal to efficiently, effectively create and enhance pollinator nesting and foraging uh, habitats uh, for pollinator reserves, as similar to what uh, Bob has mentioned earlier, and also the process and criteria for the Commissioner of Agriculture who used to perform a special registration review of neonicotinoid pesticides uh, in the state. So those were the specific things that were laid out uh, to be addressed in the pollinator report that was uh, submitted to the Minnesota legislature uh, in uh, January, as you can see here. So part of that was establishing a pollinator habitat program. And this was to develop best management practices that would enhance or protect pollinators by providing the habitat necessary uh, for their survival and reproduction. And then incorporate these BMP uh, into special training for county ag inspectors or pesticide applicators uh, because it would incorporate some of the things that would protect, enhance uh, the pollinators across the state. And then also increase a public awareness of the importance of pollinators across the state. So your the lead group, so to speak, because you're here to learn more about the importance of pollinator uh, and pollinator habitat across the state. There is a lot of people in the state and in the 50 states and Canada and Europe that don't have this interest as much as you do. This is a very, very serious and concern for the entire United States. And we can give praise to the Minnesota legislature for having the foresight to pass this type of legislation. It's the beginning process. Other states are not at this level yet. And I have visited from people from other states, and they're, they're watching Minnesota to see what we're doing. So I just wanted to get that in. So the report is available and online. Uh, it's 41 pages. There is a web page here where you can go and download, download and read that particular report. So just let me go through a couple of things uh, on the report. The research uh, suggests there was four interpretations of a pollinator bank. We can see with the different uh, circle icons, there was a museum, database, genetic, and ecological definitions or interpretations of what a pollinator bank is. So programs at museums and zoos, uh, U of M could be adapted as a museum and a database type of pollinator bank. Uh, there's a repository of honeybees, genes. Washington State University has a 
gene or a gene plasm repository, which is used by all the different researchers across the United States. Um, it's very uh, uh, well known uh, genetic uh, uh, bank at that uh, university. And then there's the ecological bank. Bob has kind of described some of those, so where you have the different diverse plants, uh, native plants, or even non-native plants that could be on a homeowner or a private land that would be uh, favorable for enticing uh, different pollinators and honeybees to forage and also nest on particular sites like those. So the proposal was to create uh, in the report uh, the, to create a new U of M faculty position to direct the museum database efforts uh, and coordinate statewide activities that would address uh, these things that are mentioned here, especially for the ecological effects. Okay, uh, pollinator habitat. There are many state, federal, uh, nonprofit organizations that have been doing some of these types of activities. I've visited with uh, Pheasants Forever, Bowser, NRCS, a lot of these pollinator habitats and practices for establishing uh, what type of uh, the site, what type of plants are in existence and they've been working with a lot of individuals or counties or organizations in helping to establish some of those. However, as Bob mentioned, there are still some gaps out there. What are all the different type of pollinators? species, native pollinator species out there that exist in the Minnesota habitat. Uh, a lot of that is unknown. Also, we have to keep in mind that the menu for native pollinator insects is not necessarily the same for honeybees. Okay, So the native uh, pollinator insects have kind of a broader palette for what they will feed on for pollen and nectar as opposed to honeybees, which is a little more narrow, okay? So we have to keep that in mind. Um, looking at some of the understanding the effectiveness of these programs, and I've already mentioned the different habitat needs for pollinators and honeybees are not the same. Um, updating some of the education and training programs will be uh, important in, and also increasing some of the public awareness of the pollinators. So the proposal in the report was to understand and enhance the pollinator habitat, uh, inventory of the invertebrates, and determine the abundant at uh, diversity and risk populations, and also revisit some of the state roadside ro uh, mowing laws uh, and practices and restore some of the uh, roadside programs such as uh, uh, wildlife for roadsides. Okay. And the other thing in the report that we're looking at is a review of the special registration review of neonicotinoids. We at the Department of Ag go through a process when we uh, do a special registration review. This diagram kind of gives you an outline of what that looks like. So we have to establish this criteria process and it's been used for a variety of different pesticides in the past. And then we're going to be working on a draft and a scope of this special neonicotinoid insect in review. So this process starts with developing a draft and then coordinating that through the different collaborators, col <laughs> collaborators from the different agencies and inform the pesticide registrant. Okay, the pesticide registrant would be the different chemical companies that would produce those particular products. So then there would be a revision of this draft scope, and then we move on to step three, uh, presenting the scope to the MBA commissioner. Uh, then there would be a review of public uh, um, comment on that for 60 days, then revising that, and then publishing the, the review here with the commissioner in the final step. So this is a process that we go through in the special registration review. Um, what we'd be looking at specifically would be some of the background chemistry, the mode of action, how this chemistry uh, acts, moves within the different uh, uh, insects, 
uh, federal and state product uh, registrations, Minnesota use and sales, risk to insect pollinators, we have to look at some information on that, application methods, and then also the benefits of why this product is being used uh, in, in uh, agriculture as well as for homeowners. Don't forget homeowners are using some of these neonicotinoid products. Okay. So this is this is used in a lot of different applications. Okay. So this uh, special review then presents a summary, uh, Minnesota specific data and uses a lot of scientific literature and citation in that and then the uh, opportunities to action or prevent unreasonable adverse effects on the, the pollinators. So that would be the process. Looking at the best management practices for pollinator habitat, we are to develop uh, the VMPs, as I mentioned earlier, providing uh, habitat necessary for their foraging and nesting, for their survival and uh, reproduction. So in our advisory core work group that was convened in uh, early July, we called upon, uh, you can see the different organizations here, Department of Ag, DNR, uh, Board of Water and Soil Resources, NRCS, U of M, and Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. So these, uh, we had several meetings, we had a cons built consensus, working relationships, discussing all the different uh, things that we have to address I'm seeing that being listened to a bit by a friend. So uh, we came, we worked through all these different processes and uh, discussions and coming to developing uh, the pollinator report. And then I just want to point out, similar to the special registration review, we'll do a similar process for the BMPs as they are developed uh, by our different work groups, and I'll talk in just a second about some of those different work groups. So we would address the pollinator legislation as it in, instructed. We've already met with our advisory core group, defining the roles, the criteria for developing these different BMPs. Uh, the advisory core group meets, and our first meeting with our BMP Pollinator work groups will take place at the end of this month in early March as well. So we're moving on to step two. Uh, then as we come to a consensus and develop and finalize these BMPs, we'll have a public notice of those. There'll be a draft of those and then a revision and then a final a publication of those BMPs that could be applicable in these different pollinator habitat uh, sites. So let's take a closer look at some of these different habitat sites where the DMPs would be applicable. We can, uh, we're looking at one of the work groups being a, associated with garden or landscapes. So that would be parks, homes, um, and it's not just in the urban areas. It's rural as well, could be individual homeowners in rural areas as well, looking at ways that they can uh, develop better habitats on their property to, uh, for the protection and habitat foraging nesting of uh, native pollinators. The other work group that we'll be meeting is roadsides or right, right of ways. So there's a lot of public land all across the state, so a lot of this is managed not only by DOT, but by township officers and highway maintenance. So they are also involved in some of our work groups as well. And then the last one is developing BMPs for what we call uh, agricultural land or near agricultural land. This does not mean in between the rows in the crop production land, but this would be more associated with border areas, fence lines, grass waterways, along uh, drainage ditches, or some uh, part of a center pivot uh, operation where it doesn't receive any type of uh, uh, disturbance from agriculture. 
okay, some of these marginal areas in the production line. 